uh, it's, it's such a shame that a lot of cap people who associate capitalism with money, but really uh, every speaker who comes here is a deeply a spiritual person, uh, and money is really a very small part of, of capitalism in my opinion. Um, our next speaker is Butler Schaefer. Uh, Mr. Schaefer has for a long time uh, f followed and learned from a spiritual teacher, uh, J. Krishnamurti. Uh, some libertarians would call the state a tyrant. While Mr. Schaefer will likely agree with this, he believes that is, the state is a lot weaker than most of, the, most of us think it is, and is prone to doing things that consistently weakens it. Usually, the state has no clue about what is going on, and in today's information age, Mr. Butler believes it's on its way out. What impresses me about Mr. Schaefer is his approach to go into the depths of human mind. Mr. Schaefer believes that freedom lies within ourselves. It is our inner sense of integrity, our sense of inner wholeness that no one can control. Prodding all of us to introspect, to see what extent, to what extent we live based on our dark side, he talks about how we condition our minds to live a subservient lives to institutional interests, including the state. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to invite Mr. Schaefer. Sadly, I'm one of the people who probably wouldn't be here, uh, but for the fact that uh, Jack is no longer with us. Um, I knew Jack uh, quite well. Um, I met him about, oh gosh, around 40 years ago, I'm estimating. And of all the things that have been said about him, I, I think one of the nicest characteristics of him, one of the most pleasant, was his genuine sense of pleasantness. You know, he was just, I don't ever remember Jack really being uh, outwardly angry. Uh, dis he disagreed with an awful lot of things. He would get into philosophic uh, quarrels with people. But was just a very pleasant individual, very good friend. We would run into each other at libertarian functions in Southern California on occasion. Uh, we usually saw each other every summer out at uh, Aspen at the Eris Society meetings that uh, Doug Casey had, had uh, organized. And then a few years ago, one of my former students, uh, who now practices law over in Phoenix, um, decided to throw a surprise birthday party for me. And he got me over there on some cockamamie pretext, I don't even remember what it was. And we got over there, and who shows up but Jack and Jay. They both drove from Orange County to Phoenix. I don't know what the distance of four or five hundred miles, I'm guessing. More. Uh, hmm? more. Yeah, okay, or more. Um, for this uh, particular, is that better? Okay. Particular event, which showed what good friends these people are. It's just, you know, to travel that far. Uh, and so, you know, I, I join in those who say that they miss Jack. I think those of us who knew him really miss him a great deal. The title of my, I don't even really want to call it a talk. I'd really like to have it be more of kind of an exploration, uh, a discussion to throw out some ideas, and then maybe open it up to really discussion, to explore some ideas, not so much to pontificate or say, here's the way, you know, I, I see the world and you'd better agree with me, uh, but to get into some areas that I think we tend not to get into. And I've sort of titled this presentation, uh, The Desire for Liberty is Not Rational. And I, I like that mainly because I figured it would stir up enough brain cells and people say, I'm going to listen to that yo-yo. What's he, what's he got? So what do you mean it's not rational? It's the best damn system we got and so forth. And a lot of this goes back to my days in the the early days in, I guess what you call it, has become libertarianism or whatever the, the name is. Uh, I was in law school uh, at the time, and 
there was a good deal, especially on that, on, on that campus, we had a group of people who put out what was probably the first legitimate uh, libertarian publication of ideas, uh, the New Individualist Review, and stimulated a lot of thought, as was also taking place in a number of other, I guess you could call them movements, in the early 1960s, the uh, civil rights movement in the United States, the feminist movement, the anti-war movement as it related to uh, the Vietnam War in particular, libertarianism. And the thing that was really encouraging about so much of this, at least in the early stages, was a willingness of people to focus on their own inner lives. Whether you're talking about uh, the feminists, uh, libertarians, whoever, there was sort of a common question that ran through so much of the thinking. Why on earth have I allowed these other institutional interests, the state, whatever it may be, to control, to dominate, to subjugate me? Why have I put up with this? And I think what happened, say with regard to <coughs> Uh, well, with regard to all of these uh, approaches, is that this lasted for maybe, <laughs> in, in cosmic time, maybe a week or two. Um, but immediately, people started saying, yeah, this is, this is not right. There's too much racial discrimination in the world. There's too much put down of women in the world. Uh, the war system is a, a terrible system. So we need to have some political reforms to change all of this. So even the libertarians, uh, and there was a time, I, I should point out, in those early days when we didn't even know what to call ourselves. That was, are, are we conservatives? Well, that doesn't quite sound right. How about uh, individualists, you know, like the New Individualist Review? Yeah, well, that sounds pretty good, but doesn't quite say it. And, and played around with some other ideas and finally captured an idea from one of the, uh, sort of a socialist anarchist by the name of Proudhon. Proudhon came up with the name libertarian. A libertarian was someone who favored liberty. And I think that sort of caught on. Like, well, okay, that's, that's, that's pretty good. And after this one to two weeks of self-exploration, people start saying, well, let's start a libertarian party. Said, oh, God, come on. <laughs> Where were you? Uh, let's change the system, so forth. Uh, there were a number of organizations that were doing a very good job of focusing on thought as it related to uh, individuals. You know, that uh, going back to perhaps the most, most forgotten of the libertarian thinkers, one that uh, very few people have even heard of, a man by the name of Leonard Reed. Any of you heard of Leonard Reed? Yeah. Leonard Reed was head of an organization called the Foundation for Economic Education, otherwise known as FEE. And when, in my early days of law practice, FEE was just about the only organization that you could look to for information on promoting free market economics and so forth. Reed was a very, very interesting person. And he said, kind of following up on some of the points that Jay was making, but if you really want to be an effective leader, you become the person that your values represent. You become that person. Then other people will seek you out. It's a little bit like Albert J. Knox's uh, work on talking about the remnant. You know, you can't, you can't. When all of this comes comes collapsing down, uh, there's no there's no point in going out and trying to find what he called the remnant, the people that are going to be left over, who are going to understand what these problems were. Uh, probably some students of Jay's would be in the, in the remnant. These would be the people that would help to put together civilization on a more peaceful, productive, free basis. And Knox said, you know, no sense trying to find them. They will find you. They will find you if they find you and your points of view and your values attractive. But now in terms of, of politics, I remember I was closely associated with um, a, a man who has been one of the more underrated of the libertarians in this whole libertarian movement, uh, F.A. Harper. 
otherwise known as Baldy Harper, who uh, started and ran the Institute for Humane Studies out in Menlo Park, California. And there was another organization that uh, Murray Rothbard and some others started out in San Francisco, known as the Cato Institute. There was another organization at, uh, out in Colorado, Rampart College and the Freedom School that Robert Lefebvre ran, and I taught out there for two years. Uh, there was <coughs> uh, Ayn Rand's organizations and the Nathaniel Brandon Institute, which helped to popularize a lot of Rand's work back in New York. So this was going on kind of all over the country. And slowly but surely, you know, people came to discover this thing called a libertarian philosophy. It is not an exaggeration when I tell you that there was a time, a time that I can recall quite clearly, when the people who were libertarians, called themselves libertarians, knew each other. <laughs> Didn't, you may not have met them, but you knew them, knew them by name. Uh, out there in Orange County, who's that guy's guy? Jason Nelson, who's Jason Nelson? Huh? He's a libertarian, oh, that's interesting. Well, I'm going back to Pittsburgh next week. Uh, oh, you're going to Pittsburgh? Be sure and look up Joe Schlock. Who, who's Joe Schlock? Well, he's a libertarian. We've got a libertarian in Pittsburgh? <laughs> you think that's funny. It does sound funny, doesn't it? It really sounds funny. That's what it was. Mary Rothbard once said that uh, there was a time when all of the libertarians in the country could meet in his apartment in New York. Mary had a typical small <laughs> New York apartment. He was right. He was really right. And so this process of exploration kind of went on uh, uh, for some time and a lot of Along the way, a lot of people decided, yeah, the, the best way to uh, change all of this is through politics. As Mark Twain once put it, nothing so needs reforming as other people's habits. <laughs> and so you had the feminists off wanting to get legislation to prohibit this, that, and the other thing. The civil rights uh, movement wanted to prohibit discrimination and, 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 and the like. Uh, the anti-war movement, I think, was probably the most pathetic during the 60s because they were interested solely in opposition to the Vietnam War. They had no understanding of, no interest in, what are the conditions that make for peace? And so the state could turn people on and off, you know, the people in the anti-war movement, turn you on or off depending upon some policy change. But we're going to have peace talks. Oh, well, we're not going to have any more anti-war demonstrations. Well, gee, they started bombing uh, Laos. Really? Well, let's have a let's have an anti-war demonstration about that. There was no there was no integrity to it. Kind of the way you see, at least in America, uh, regarding these perpetual wars that are going on in the Middle East. You know, when Bush was president, and he had all of the uh, people on the uh, socialist left, and I with uh, Jay on this. These are not liberals. Liberal used to be a good word, not anymore. Uh, who could be counted on for a daily anti-war demonstration any place. And as soon as Obama gets elected president, no more of that. In fact, if you want to be in opposition to the war that Obama is running, you must be a racist. You don't like the war simply because you're upset and you have a black man as president. People say this. You know, former President Jimmy Carter said this. People who are opposing Obama's Obamacare, or Medicare, or whatever they call it, probably do so because they present the idea of having a black man as president. Good God. Good grief. Well, anyway, um, I've been of the view for some time that um, even the, the black civil rights movement, uh, I was always attracted to Malcolm X. And I think the reason for that was that uh, at one point in time, he went to the Middle East, came back, and as a result of his trip to the Middle East, he, he made the observation that you know, this isn't a black and white thing. The, the, the whites and the blacks and so forth are facing the same internal problem. And we need to get together and focus on that. A few weeks later, he was killed. So um, that's where some of this comes from. I 
with, with open kind of with the same observations that uh, Jay had on epistemology. Uh, I've always regarded epistemology as the most fundamental question that we never ask. How do we know what we know? More important than what we know is how do we know what we know? How do we evaluate this? And of course no one wants to examine that, at least in their, while they're in the comfort of their own particular set of beliefs. It may be, it may be that we are presently in one of Kuhn's uh, paradigm shifts right now in that I think you know, Western civilization, I think it's finished, it, it's, it's gone. Uh, at least it is in America, I don't know. I haven't been that close to the situation in, in other countries. But the principles, the values, even the organizational forms, you know, constitutional government, say in the United States, is just no more. It's gone. It's nobody pays any attention to it. You know, if the president wants to have unlimited power to do whatever he wants to do. Nobody objects. Congress doesn't object. The courts don't object. He didn't. He wants to do it, he do it. So all of these things that we've held up as examples of the creative and liberating and other influences of Western civilization are pretty much shot. On the positive side of it, I, th I see a great deal of energy being generated in alternative ways of living, alternative social systems. The internet is just one example, just one. I, I, people say, wow, there's the internet. The internet, yeah, but there's a lot of other technology that is helping to push decision making, push human behavior, our lives with one another in different directions than the top down, vertically structured institutional systems that we've been accustomed to. In my, in my you know, the first book that I wrote about, you know, about 25 years ago, I guess, uh, Calculated Chaos, I, I developed the idea that I think that our whole problem is not just government. The problem is the entire institutional order. It's institutionalized thinking. The idea that organizations which I think are very important. We, we are social beings. We are not hermits. We don't live very well as hermits. If we tried living as hermits, we'd probably all die in better days. So we are organizational people. But one of the things that we have done with organizations is to find something that works. It's a, yeah, this, this, this really works. And then institutionalize it in the sense of we've got to make it permanent, we've got to secure its foundations, we've got to protect it from change. Why? Because, as Jay was pointing out earlier, they're too big to fail. We've got to shell out hundreds of billions of dollars to corporations to salvage them. No, they don't, when they don't work the way they're supposed to work, you let them die, drop by the wayside. You don't keep trying to pump air into a dead horse. And yet that's, that's kind of the institutional view of things. We need to save <clears throat> the organizations. So the organizations themselves, having become institutions, also acquire power. And so we have not just the state, but you know, the state as defined in terms of a corporate state. You know, whose interests are really being advanced through political systems? You know, it, these are corporate, uh, corporate interests. And one of the areas I would like to <clears throat> kind of focus on a little bit here this morning has to do with the area of religion. And I'm talking now about institutionalized religion, organized religion, religions that operate on the basis of articles of faith and catechisms and dogmas and so forth, that by God, if you don't believe this, if you don't, you know, cross the T so many times at a particular point in the presentation, you know, you're going to go to hell, something else is going to happen. But at the same time, I found that historically, when you go back and look at human history, that the entire history of humanity has been wrapped up in a lot of what I would call spiritual or small-r religious pursuits. 
spiritual meaning that <clears throat> we have all, I think, looked to looked at the world in terms of trying to figure out such questions as you know, where is it? Where did all this come from? Where is it all going? And what rules are in place while we're here? And when I think of what many religious or spiritual inquiries have gone into, and what uh, the scientific inquiry has gone into, it's the same question. Different, different approaches, different methodology, but uh, the spirituality is based largely on a great deal of, well, how do it, speculation, I suppose, is a good way of putting it. Of, of kind of wondering, you know, what, what's, this, what's this all about? The problem is that people then start believing the speculation. They start thinking the speculation is fact. Yeah, there was, there was all this stuff about the Garden of Eden. You know, that's how we got here. And there was Adam and Eve. And, oh, they screwed everything up. And now the, 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 real, the real people who are entitled to life on this planet are not us. We're outside intruders. Uh, it's the plants and the animals and the fish and the birds and so forth. Uh, we're screwing everything up for them. And this has given birth to uh, a new secular religion known as environmentalism. Environmentalism is just another form of religion. People say, well, I'm not, I'm not going to go to the Catholic Church or Jewish synagogue or Presbyterian Church or anything like that anymore. I'm, I'm an atheist and I'm going to devote my time to environmentalism. Just another religion. Same Garden of Eden myth, same Apocalypse at the end, all kinds of sins in between. It is, look at it. I, <clears throat> I did an article, um, I, I do a lot of writing for, for Lou Rockwell. And thank you, I, I, well, I forgot to bring it up with me. Thanks. Yeah. $100 bill, that's great. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> But my then three-year-old <coughs> three granddaughter was over at our house uh, one afternoon, just kind of dancing around, just and she had been to a dancing class that she had. And she was kind of romping and stomping all the moves she had learned and, and so forth. And I was thinking about the attitude of the environmentalists. You know, <coughs> we're supposed to reduce our carbon footprint. Well, you stop and think about it. What it really says, what that really means is, die. Think about it. Not only you dying, but all these the trees and the plant life and so forth also dying. Because what what happens when we when we breathe in and breathe out? And of course, we're going to breathe out more heavily. Breathe in, breathe out both more heavily when we're very active. So if we're up there dancing and so forth, we're taking in more oxygen. And we're expelling more carbon dioxide. Whoa, we can't have that, said the environmentalists. That's the that's a violation of something or other that, oh, I know what it is. That's leading to global warming. Climate is the new God. And we are the priesthood of the environmentalists is to interpret what the new God, i.e. climate, wants. And one thing that they want, it's the, same, it's the same game that you get played in the earlier forms of religion. You know, I've got a pipeline to heaven, I've got a pipeline to the gods in some way, and they tell me what you people need to do. And if you don't do it, you're not going to have a, you know, favorable crops, uh, your, your wife will be barren, uh, the economy will go to hell, all these terrible things. But you just pay attention to what I'm saying because God speaks to me and I speak to you. Fortunately, nobody thinks that way anymore, right? <laughs> Who was the guy, the president before Obama? What was his name? God wanted me to be president. Uh -huh. And you remember the early pictures of Obama when, after he was elected and the pictures with a halo around his head? <laughs> So anyway, um, 
So it's just, it's just a new religion, a new belief system. But it doesn't, I think, answer the question of why have all of us, why have people been so susceptible to these kinds of inquiries? Why have our ancestors for tens of thousands of years been interested in these sort of religious pursuits, speculations, and so forth? And I think it has to do with what I would call a sense of, of kind of an inner spirituality. And I, spirituality with a lowercase s. And I'm not talking about anything, you know, of any kind of outwardly objective truth in the world, but just a speculative thing. What's it all about? Why are we here? What's, I, I remember getting into this when I was in, in college and took a number of uh, political theory courses. And you'd read these various uh, political philosophers, you know, Plato and Marx and uh, Edmund Burke and John Locke and so forth. And I remember as I read through these, I would read some of Plato, and I well, I really didn't like Plato. I still don't. Uh, really didn't care for Plato. He was not of my, of, of my liking. Edmund Burke, well, every once in a while he said something rather interesting. Well, okay, yeah, but he also said some, some dumb things. You know, and you get into, uh, you know, the works of John Locke, John Stuart Mill. So, hey, now, now they're talking. This, this is good stuff. I like this. Um, and afterwards, I sort of wondered to myself, why? What, what, am I, what am I responding to? Is it the logic and the reasoning of their position? You know, Marx, Marx's philosophy, you, you, you can use logic and validate much of what he says. Logically, if you just if logic is is the basis for determining truth, you know, you can take his initial premise and extend it outward to certain conclusions. The same with John Locke. So the question always goes back and, and Ayn Rand had, I think, had really focused on this. You you gotta go back and examine your premises. What are the premises that you begin with? What is the premise you begin with if you're reading Marx? What is the premise you begin with? If you're reading John Locke, what is the premise that you would begin with if you're reading, you know, any social philosopher? What is their beginning point? And I remember one day when I was in law school, uh, Jane and I were walking along the, uh, by the Museum of Science and Industry there in Chicago, and all this kind of came upon me in one of these uh, sort of epiphanies, I guess people would call them. But I had this sense of why should I have to justify my desire for personal liberty on any basis other than my own will? And I haven't found any better answer to that than was found in the, first, in the question in the first place. Why do I have to justify my desire to be left alone, to not be victimized by others? Why do I have to justify that on any basis other than the fact I don't like it? I don't want to, you know, just, and this has led me into kind of a continuing examination of this whole area of, well, I guess the, the, the spiritual basis for our lives, the spiritual basis for our thinking. Who are we? Why does it matter? Why do we care? Why did any of you people show up for this? Why do you really care? Why did I, why did Jane and I get on a plane and fly up here and so forth to discuss all this stuff? Why? It cost us money, so in that sense it's costing all of us money, so in that sense it's, uh, it's a cost. Is there a benefit? And I think you, we have to kind of get back to the place where we're, making an examination of the underlying sense of who we are. We would like the world to be better for a number of reasons. For our own convenience, I suppose. For the well-being and convenience of our children, grandchildren, and, and so forth. And maybe for something even broader. I knew one man who was probably as vocal a critic of the state as you could imagine. He had no family at all. So it isn't the sense of 
you know, he's looking to protect his family or his children and so forth from all of these consequences. Is there something else? Is, is there something within each of us that drives us to find, you know, a better way of, uh, of living in the world? Well, going back to the role that institutions play in our lives, one of the, and this kind of follows up on what Jay was talking about, although I think a little different interpretation of it, by becoming institutionalized, we adopt the view that the organizations with which we identify ourselves have central importance. Because if I identify myself politically, I am an American, Woo! I am a Presbyterian, wow! I am white, I am, you know, whatever. Whatever the identity is, we identify ourselves with certain categories. And then we create sort of a big boundary line to circumscribe those identities. And sometimes these identities overlap, don't they? I'm an American who's also, a, say, a Presbyterian, who's also you know, black, who's also whatever it may be. They can overlap. But the problem we get into with politics is the political system not only encourages this kind of identification, but it's a, it's a method that it uses to control us. Dave, I know you're up to something. I can't see. What is, you're wearing a black shirt. I'm wearing a blue shirt. Me too. Huh? <laughs> well, yeah, but you covered it up. Aha. Uh -huh. you're, you're going incognito. So therefore, we've got the black shirt of people and the blue shirt of people. And we have someone that's going to warn us, you know, the, you know, you got to look out. Someone's going to come up, some politically minded person. You got to look, watch out for those black shirted people. And I say, why that? Well, they're probably a, a secret terrorist organization or something. Then they're going to talk to David and say, watch out for these guys with blue shirts. They're up to no good. Well, we don't do it on that simplistic level, but we do do it on the basis of nationality, don't we? We do it on the basis of race. Do it on the basis of gender the basis of lifestyle, on the basis of religious views, and so forth. Watch out for those Muslims. Oh, you don't want a Muslim moving into your neighborhood. Oh, let's get some legislation passed. This is going on. This isn't just hypothetical stuff. This is going on in our world. Someone wants to build a Muslim church in a predominantly Christian community. Oh, that's going to be a center for terrorism, no doubt about it. Instead of burning witches at the stake, we'll be hanging Muslims. And you'd better be willing to cough up some money in the form of taxation to provide for the necessary defense mechanisms. And maybe you're going to have to be conscripted into the military to go fight these people. Because you know, if, we don't, if we don't fight them over there, <laughs> where are we going to fight them? You don't want that, do you? So, yeah, well, okay, well, I'll do this for the sake of my family or, <clears throat> or certainly for the sake of the big grand institution that I identify with, namely the American state. The American state wants, wants me to do this, so I'll do it. Jay was talking about the, um, the activities in, in Nazi Germany. One very important book. I, I, if you're interested in this subject, I'd encourage, encourage you to read a book by Milton Mayer, M-A-Y-E-R. He was, I think, president of the <coughs> Society, I forgot the name of the study, the Society for the Study of Democratic Institutions, I think it was in, San, in Santa Barbara. And right after World War II, he went over to Germany and just lived among ordinary German people. Some guy who might have worked at the post office, someone else who might have been a, a tailor, someone else who, you know, whatever. These were not top government officials or big industrialists or things. Just the ordinary people in Germany. To find out what was it really like to live under a system of tyranny? What was it like to live under a dictatorship? The title of the book gives you the answer he got from every one of these people. The title of the book is, They Thought They Were Free. 
they thought they were free. And I suspect that in America or Canada, if you ask most people the same question to define freedom, what does freedom really mean? Well, probably means if you do what the government tells you, you won't get into any trouble. There was a, <clears throat> a movie that was out on uh, one of these television series movies that was out a number of years ago called The Holocaust. It involved uh, taking you through various families that uh, lived in Germany in the 1930s up through the early war years. And toward the end there were these two elderly men at Auschwitz or whatever the particular prison camp was who were being marched off to be killed. And one turns to the other and said, they're marching us off to kill us. Why do we still obey? I turned to Jane and said, because if we don't, we're going to be in serious trouble. <laughs> and that sounds funny, but that's exactly the way most people think. That's the way most people think. It's just, wow. You know, I could really be in trouble if I don't. If I, if I become a troublemaker on the way to the gas chamber, you know, I'm going to. Good Lord, how screwed up can we get? It was interesting using the Nazi concentration camp example. Uh, one of the best books, I think, written on the, the psychology of the prisoners in these camps was Viktor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning. Any of you ever any, anybody read that? Yeah, hey, great, that's good. Man's Search for Meaning. Frankl was a psychiatrist who was imprisoned in two different concentration camps. He also survived. And he said that the people who survived were those who had a very strong inner sense of reality. They did not let other people define reality for them. And at the same time, he said these were people who were very supportive of one another. That if some, one of your fellow prisoners was having a problem, you helped them, you, you did what you could for them. So these are the people who survived. And it gets me back into the same, the same question. Why, why have we become so dispirited in our own lives, our own sense of, of who we are? And a lot of it, I think, goes back to having identified ourselves with institutions. The things that are of interest to us, individual liberty, for example, um, not being trespassed upon, not being you know, offended in some, some fashion. There are a lot, of, a lot of things that are important to us that are of no interest whatsoever to institutions because they don't contribute to the power interests of institutions. Institutions, whether they're the state, corporations, and so forth, are interested in those forms of human energy that can be utilized on behalf of institutional in ends. How can we use you to further our ends as a, as a corporation, as the state, whatever it may be? And things that are not useful to the institutional order in that fashion become a form of entropy. Entropy meaning energy unavailable for produ otherwise productive use. There's a lot of human energy out there. But if it can't be used by the institutions in our lives, then it's a form of entropy. It's a form of waste that needs to be eliminated. This is why political systems have always uh, <clears throat> disliked individual liberty. This is why organized religions have always disliked people who might speculate on the basis of other religious views or non-religious views. Oh my goodness, he thinks that? Oh, that's not, I don't find that any place in my list of catechisms here, so he's an infidel. I have to prosecute him in some, some fashion. And we learn to think of ourselves this way. How many of you work in an organization or have worked in an organization that has a human resource management office? Thank you. You see the, the problem? Are you a human resource? Like cows? Like so many bags of fertilizer? Well, let's go down and, you know, 
let's go down and get some more, we need some more human, Reagan, go, 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 someone go get Reagan and bring her up, we need another human resource. And she's ill. Good Lord, I, when I was in law practice, so, I represented management in labor law problems. This is one, one of the things we kind of encouraged our, our clients, why don't you change the name of this office, human, human resource management, Jesus Christ, come on. You know, these just, you know, so much non-human fodder to be fed into your machine. But we think of ourselves this way, don't we? We think of ourselves. How many of you are big wheels in your organization? How many of you are an asset to your community? How many of you just get, I don't know, turned off by other people? Or get turned on by some other people? How many of you sometimes have those days where you just feel like, you just, just got my wires crossed? And I'm kind of feeling burned out right now. All the kind of attributes we attribute to machines, don't we? I just ran out of gas, that's all. And so we, we incorporate this mindset into our own view of who we are. At least to the extent that we've managed to organize ourselves institutionally. I was, this, uh, this was something I hadn't even planned on mentioning, but on the way up from LA, I just brought a book along with it. I just received uh, Amazon, I guess I was, I ordered it through. And I thought, well, it looks like it'd be a fun book to read. It's a book called Back to the Land. But a city in, or a town, not even a city, a town in West Virginia by the name of Arthurdale, about FDR's New Deal and the Costs of Economic Planning by C.J. Maloney. It's a wonderful, wonderful treatment of how, and this goes back to what Jay was talking about, the people who were really well educated. Eleanor Roosevelt created this town, basically, along with FDR, and it was a pet project. It was a project to collectivize, to show how you could collectivize the human race. And that was, that, not putting words in their mouth, that was what they wanted to do, to, to create a collective community. And they had all kinds of resources available to them. Any amount of money that the government wanted to spend on this was just whizzed right through. I mean, Eleanor wanted it. Both Eleanor and FDR on various occasions would uh, every year go to uh, the high school there and deliver the commencement address. I mean, this wasn't just a hobby. This was a fixation that particularly Eleanor Roosevelt had. And so how do we, how do we break down the individuality in communities? This is their word, again, not mine. The focus on individuality, oh, that's, you don't get uniformity that way. We need to figure out some way to get, not only to get a collective mindset in this community, but to enforce it. There were people who were evicted from the community. One man in particular, I remember, was evicted because he didn't shop at the community co-op store. Well, you can't live here. And the notions of individual liberty and, and the like were just not. That was part of the entropy of this organization. Well, the whole thing just collapsed as it was kind of like a Potemkin village of the, of the New Deal. And you read through all this stuff, the people who were running the, this community, who designed it, the Rexford Tugwells and others, who were, they like to call themselves New Dealers, and basically they were all communists. I mean, this is, you know, I don't know how things are in Canada, but at least in America, most Americans love communism. They always have and they always will. All you have to do is ask a few key questions. You know, if the interests, if the interests of the of the group can be advanced by the sacrifice of David here, happened to be in the front, so that's where I got picked up. Um, let's say the interests of this whole group would be best off if we were to sacrifice David. We're all on a lifeboat and we're running out of food, and so we're going to have him for dinner. Would most people agree or disagree with that? Do you think? Elizabeth? 
I think most I think most Americans would agree. Yeah, I'm sorry. Utilitarian premise: the greatest good for the greatest number. I remember in law school class uh, class in jurisprudence, uh, Carl Llewellyn responding to a student who said, to him, "Well, what about?" What about the utilitarian premise, the greatest good for the greatest number? And the well just the person says, what about the greatest good for the greatest guy? <laughs> but it's, it, it's been a, it's a fun book to read. It, it's the kind of book that I think can be useful to, to illustrate in a very concrete, detailed fashion, you know, what we're trying to object to in a broader context. I, my writing and thinking and so forth is more right brain oriented. I'm looking for spatial and uh, broader patterns of, of, of things to look at. I'm not very left brain. I'm not a linear, detailed kind of person. This gives you a very linear, detailed description of what is so objectionable to those of us who like to think in more of a right brain setting. It's interesting to see the observations, to read the observations of the people who live there. Many, some of whom are not many, but some of whom are still alive. You know, what they thought, and it was. You know, they said, well, they appreciated what was created. They appreciated the support that the government provided and all that, but they just didn't like all the regimentation. And so the whole experience kind of collapsed. Or moved on, perhaps, is a better way of putting it. Moved on to other communities. Uh, I think as a consequence of our becoming so institutionalized, we have tended to disregard those aspects of our personality, of our thinking, and so forth, that are really life-sustaining. But because they are of no use to institutions, we're discouraged from ever experiencing them. If a problem arises, what's the first thing that the media tells us to do? It's a major problem, a real crisis, a big accident or something like that, or 9-11 or something like that. We're supposed to do what? Stay home. Don't, don't get excited. And just relax. Just be Maybe, maybe there's a point in time where you, sh God damn it, should, <laughs> should get excited. Because you know, when you get excited, my goodness, all kinds of alternative behavior might start popping up and the system might not like that. We see this as well in you know, the, the role that we find even in, in scientific inquiry. The the role that speculation, that guesswork, um, intuition, uh, accidents, and so forth, have played in the uh, scientific process. Uh, Paul Feyerabend wrote a very interesting book on this titled Against Method, and pointing out that you know there, there are so many of these discoveries that have been aided and abetted by dreams and so forth, which scientists then will turn around and investigate, you know, use the scientific method to validate whether or not uh, any of this is true. And we have rejected so much of this in our lives. We've learned to reject it. We don't, we don't think that the inner life is really worth anything more than just kind of a form of entertainment. And I, I I think it may be one of the more important transformations that may take place as we find our present civilization collapsing and perhaps a, a, a more, more improved social order, social culture arising. Keep in mind, when medievalism collapsed, thanks in some part to Gutenberg's invention, which this, the institutional order has never gotten over. Um, what did we have? What, what came after, after Gutenberg? Well, we had the Renaissance, we had the Enlightenment, we had the Age of Reason, we had the Scientific Age, we had the Industrial Revolution. What is likely to occur as a result of what I call the, the, the fourth stage in 
the evolution of information, the information evolution has taken place in, among human beings since the days when our ancestors first invented language. We're now at the fourth stage of all of this, in which we now have the capacity to do what we never, what we humans never had the capacity to do before, to communicate directly with every human being on the planet. We have the capacity for that. Did you ever think about that? With my little computer at home, which by the way, the experts told us uh, about 40 years ago, the people who were in the computer manufacturing business said, there will never be a computer in the home. One, one man in particular who made this observation, there will never be a computer in the home. It might be difficult to find any home without a computer, and I don't just mean laptops, I mean just computerized technology. But by virtue of the, of the technology of, of the computer, I can go online and communicate with every human being on the planet, provided two things. One, they have a computer. Two, they're interested in hearing from me. But you know, this whole idea that information is coming from the top down, it's coming from the philosopher kings who are going to regulate everything for us and design everything and predict everything because the world is simply too complex to not have that kind of centralized control. And what we now find, particularly through uh, the use of uh, chaos theory and the study of complexity is that the world is too complex to be ordered and organized through any means other than <coughs> the anarchistic means. The idea that people can sit atop pyramids of power and regulate the lives of hundreds of millions or even billions of people is so ludicrous that you, know, you just sort of wonder how on earth can otherwise intelligent human beings still buy into this stuff. But you know, the politician, uh, the, the state is kind of going in that direction. And of course, the, the politicians say, well, this is all necessary for, our, for the war on terrorism. It's not a war on terrorism that's being fought. Terrorism is just a name somebody attaches to behavior that other people dislike. What is really being fought is a war to preserve uh, the institutional hierarchy, a war to shore up the foundations of the corporate state. And anything that stands in the way, any of you who stand in the way, any of you who have these ideas of maybe you can do things on your own basis through alternative means of organization, you'll become terrorists. You're, you're, we are now, we are, this whole room is a room full of terrorists. You people don't believe in the sanctity of political rule. My goodness. I've been <coughs> so enthused by the example of WikiLeaks. I don't know how many of you follow much of that. But the capacity of someone, one, one man, to put something out on the internet that hundreds and hundreds of millions of other people can say, ah, oh, this is what they've been up to. Hmm. And the state still responds in terms of, well, there's Julian Assange, he's the problem. We'll lock him up in a cage someplace and keep him there until he dies. And when he dies, he won't be around to embarrass us anymore and we can go back to business as normal. These guys don't get it. The members of the old institutional order just don't get it. They don't see what it is they're up against. You know, it's not, it's not WikiLeaks, it's the capacity of computerized technology to disperse information to hundreds of millions of people. But all of that depends, I think, on how you answer the question. Do you deserve to be in that position? Do you deserve to have that kind of control over your life? Do you deserve a condition of liberty? I make a distinction between what I call freedom and liberty. I don't, I don't use them as synonymous terms. I think freedom is a condition that exists within your own mind. 
to live without contradiction, to live without confusion, to live without conflict, is to be free. It kind of goes back to the, the Stoic philosophers. And I remember when I was reading uh, political philosophy, I was really attracted to the Stoics. There's something nice about this idea that you, know, you can imprison me, you can do all these other sorts of things, but you can't, you can't get to me. You can't imprison me. You can imprison my body, but not me. And we, we get so attached to things. We get, have such attachments to our property, for example, that whenever the state comes in and makes a threat, look, you better, you better go along with this, or else we're going to take more of your property. Oh, OK. OK, I'll bend over. You just tell me what I have to do. And I contrast that with some other people, I think, who have figured out how to live how to live this way without these kinds of, of attachments. Um, one of my old, uh, some of the people I've learned from my Irish, my Irish ancestry, that's these wonderful people known as leprechauns. I don't know if any of you have actually met any leprechauns, but they're lovely souls. And Irish folklore, which, by the way, is the only publication of record that uh, the leprechauns acknowledge. <laughs> Irish folklore tells us that the leprechauns are very protective of their property. They're very protective of their gold. And there will be hell to pay. If you ever get a hold of their gold, they're gonna, you're, you're going to suffer as they endeavor to get it back. But as much as they value their gold, they value their liberty even more. There have been stories told, uh, once again, validated in Irish folklore, just look it up, of leprechauns hiding in the bushes, watching while thieves come along and steal their gold. And they're just so angry and they're sad and everything else, but they're not going to expose themselves because they don't want their liberty taken from them. So the leprechauns would be people I would consider to be in the category of free, free people, for people who can live without a sense of having expectations of others that can be enforced, people who live without division, who don't separate one another, separate their neighbors out according to any sorts of categories, race, religion, whatever it might be. Liberty, on the other hand, I would define as a condition in which free people live together. I don't know, all of you, I don't know very many of you here, but I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt and presume that all of you are free people in the sense in which I have defined it. If we all went off and you know, found ourselves on an otherwise deserted island in some fashion, um, how would we live with, with one another? Would we respect one another's inviolability? Would we respect one another's boundaries? Would we live peacefully? Would we use exchange, voluntary exchange, as a way of dealing with one another? I suspect we probably would. And so when you have free people living in society together, I call that a condition of liberty. So liberty is a social condition. Freedom is the mindset of people who Live in live in society. You you could you could live in any major city. Washington D.C. is the one I always like to use as maybe the best example. A free person could live in Washington D.C. That person would not be living in liberty. So if all of us ended up in some little community someplace, um, all of us being free people, who would enjoy liberty? We wouldn't enjoy it if all of us happened to live in Washington, D.C. So how do we get to that? How do we get to that state of mind? My, one of my grandchildren, my four-year-old grandson back in Minnesota, advised us recently that when he grows up, he wants to design robots. His father's an engineer, so just, so much of what he is interested in uh, has kind of an engineering background. There is something, I think, to genetics and all of this. 
So he wants to be, wants to design robots. And my response was, well, okay, you can design them and sell them and all of that. Just don't become one. <laughs> and he and his six-year-old sister were having a rather interesting discussion the other day, so I'm told I got a second hand, <clears throat> on the concept of being and nothingness. How can nothing exist? What does it mean to have nothing? Were, you, were we thinking that way when we were four and six years old? No, well, there's hope for it. Um, I think that part of the, <clears throat> the attraction to what I call these uh, the, the spiritual <clears throat> dimension in our lives comes up every once in a while, particularly in news events. And some of the examples I have used would be the, the, the classic photograph of the little Vietnamese, the naked Vietnamese girl running down the road after the Amer American napalm attack. Or the photo of the, there's no photos, a videotape really, of the individuals bringing down the Berlin Wall or the photograph of this little Cuban boy, Elian Gonzalez, who had a machine gun stuck in his face by one of Janet Reno's Nazi stormtroopers who was trying to forcibly take him from his home. Or maybe the most, what to me is the most emotionally laden picture of all was a picture of Wang Wei Lin, Chinese man who stood out in front of that row of tanks in Tiananmen Square and just stood there. You know, he wasn't, he wasn't trying to overthrow the Chinese government. He wasn't even trying to overthrow the tanks. He was just standing there. One lonely individual standing up to the faceless machinery of state destruction. If that didn't turn you on, by God, I don't know what you're doing here. I really don't. Didn't that, didn't that send some kind of a chill up your spine? And if it did, why? Why would it matter? Why would it matter for, you know, whether all this stuff goes on in the world or not? Why don't you just accept the idea of the Madeleine Albright view of the world? Well, we have our governmental policy here, and if 500,000 Iraqi children have to die because of it, that's a price I'm willing to pay. Well, bitch, you didn't pay it. Pardon my language, but I am. You didn't pay it. 500,000 children did it. And these were 500,000 human beings. They were not collateral damage. That's the way in which the state excuses them. Well, that was just collateral damage. It was by accident. We didn't intend that. I don't care whether you intended it or not. It's a consequence of what you're doing that's a problem. Whether you really intended to do good or you intended to do bad is irrelevant. I'm sure that these people probably Elder Roosevelt and all these other people who are behind this idea of collecting, creating a collective community probably really intended some good consequence from all of this. It's irrelevant. It's what they did. It's what the outcome was. Getting back to Jay's presentation, you know. Causation. What caused what? I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm I said I'm going to kind of open this up as a discussion of in the to it. Um, any questions anyone has? Any discussion you'd like to promote? Last chance. If you don't, I'm going to go on talking. <laughs> Yeah. I'm sorry, what? What is my what? I, I have a hard time 
doing that in part because I've become very interested in the study of chaos and complexity in recent years. And study of, and this, by the way, the study of chaos is what's going to, uh, I think, really bring down the state. Study of chaos is based on the premise that complex systems are simply, they have too many variables associated with them to make things predictable. And this has been the, the problem with government planning in an economic setting. You know, in order to, in order to predict outcomes, you have to be able to have what say a chaos scientists call a sensitive dependence on initial conditions. For me to be able to predict, for you to be able to predict even in your own life what's going to happen in the next week, you have to know every facet of the influences that are going to be at work on your life. Is your Aunt Tilly going to die? Well, oops. What would I know about that? Well, she was killed in the mountain climbing. Well, I didn't know about that. No way you can predict that. And so when, <clears throat> this, is, this is the same problem you get into with, with the political structure. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not asking <laughs> to be put atop the pyramid. I'm, I'm not saying, you know, I'm a better philosopher king than these other people are. I don't know. I do see trends. One trend is that things are becoming increasingly decentralized. They're moving away from this and more toward that. This is what has the <clears throat> established order in, in a frantic state. Why would, why would they keep coming up with more and more intrusive regulations and interventions and so forth? Why would they do this? To, to reinforce their collapsing structure. If you lived in a family where, let's say, the father and the family behave this way toward the rest of the family, how would you characterize that family? You know, well, son or daughter, we're going to go through all of your belongings here in your bedroom, make sure you don't have anything that we don't want you to have. We're going to follow you around on your dates, and we're going to do tests on, on you to find out what you've been eating or drinking or smoking or whatever else it is. We're going to do all of that. What do you think is going to happen? What's going to happen in that society? One thing that's going to happen is the kids are going to secede. <laughs> Kids are going to pack up and say, the hell with this. I'm going to go as far away as I can. I'm not going to put up with this anymore. So extend that out over an entire culture. So this is, this is already happening. Well, secession is a movement, at least down in the States. I don't know how much of it is up here, but there's a great deal of this uh, going on. There are nullification movements. Tom Woods and written a very good book on nullification. Nullify Now, I think, was the title of it. The state of Texas, the legislature of the state of Texas overwhelmingly passed a statute which provides that employees of TSA or any other organization that grope people at airports, that would be considered a sexual offense. People who do it will be prosecuted and imprisoned. And when they get out, they will have to bear the stamp of being a convicted sex offender. The governor, I guess, is going to sign it or did sign it. What was the federal government's response to this? Hmm? We won't fly into Texas. Well, then you won't fly out. You won't fly even within Texas. Texas will be a no-fly zone. Any of you in the, well, any of you have a military background to know what a no-fly zone means? It means that any other planes other than ours that are caught flying in the space will be shot down. That's what these guys in Washington have in mind. Ultimately, ultimately. Jay is absolutely right. You either obey or ultimately will kill you. That's, that's the reality of things. Want some history on that? Well, let's go take a look at Nazi Germany and Stalinist Russia, Maoist China, Pol Pot, Cambodia, and so forth. We'll get rid of some people one way or another. Get it down to a manageable herd. I, I, I really, I, it's, but you see, to, to have a manageable herd, you have to have people who've already inculcated the herd mindedness, haven't you? The herd instinct. I'm part of this group. I'm part of some institutionalized definition of things. I am an American. Oh, then I'd better do what they tell me. 
because that's me acting. And when I do it, then the people in Germany told Bill Mayer afterwards, said, huh? nothing wrong with that, we were free. We were free. We managed to stay out of the concentration camps. We managed not to get shot. Oh, Jane, I forgot to bring my little white rose pin today. I usually go <coughs> wear a white rose pin that uh, was a good conversation starter. What is that for? But, well, honors the organization of basically teenage kids in Nazi Germany who had an organization known as the White Rose Society. And these people were out doing all kinds of things to kind of throw monkey wrenches into the machinery of the state. A lot of them got caught. One of them, they, they did a movie on this one young woman who was one of the leaders of this, Sophie Scholl. And if you ever seen the movie Sophie Scholl, see it if you haven't. Oh, it's, <clears throat> it's, it's a well done, it's a well done movie. But this is the way, this is the way political systems operate. Keep in mind, you, you define political systems as, you ask any political scientist, and I'm glad that Jay reminded us that people who call their field of study a science aren't. They're not engaged in the science. You know, I don't know of any, I'm taking a course in chemistry science, I'm taking a course in physics science. Well, you say, well I, was, I majored in social science. Huh? <laughs> but, um, I lost myself. You well, know, anyway. Um, okay. Right. You, you spoke about um, institutions other than the state and how they are. Well, other, including the state. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Including yeah. the state, other than the state as well, and they have this sort of dehumanizing, I guess, my word, effect that you're talking about. Uh, but we are, as you mentioned, social creatures and uh, organizational creatures. We operate within institutions. What are, and are there institutions that are more resilient and more conducive to human flourishing? And, what are their characteristics? Well, I think, yeah, I, I think that the government of Iceland would probably be a more pleasant uh, political system to live under than the government of the United States, for example. Um, but keep in mind, one, one of the things I said, and I really want to emphasize it, is that we are social creatures. We we organize with one another. We would not enjoy anywhere near the kind of lifestyles that we have if someplace along the way we hadn't discovered the benefits of division of labor. You know, if each one of us was really self-sufficient, we'd still be out picking grub worms off the trees. You know, and eating them, that would be it. But we figured out that I can work at whatever it is I can do best and produce whatever it is, and I produce a surplus, um, I, I uh, let's say grow, grow corn, and I grow a lot of corn, and I have more than I can eat, and so I have a surplus, and so I sell it to you, sell my surplus to you in exchange for what? Well, you've got something else. Maybe you can build you know, a cabin or something like that, or some clothing, or whatever it may be. And so we, we've advanced ourselves this way through organization. Our problem arises when we find an organization that really seems to be working, and then we want to make it permanent. I forgot who it was who said that the big, one of the biggest dangers we have is, is the insistence on trying to repeat our successes. You see this with little kids, I've noticed it with, you know, you've all seen this, and you've probably all done it when you were a little kid. You do something and funny as hell to all the adults. The kids are like, ah, and, and what does the kid do? He repeats it over and over and over. And it was funny the first time, the repeat, forget it. But this is the way we've lived our lives in other settings. Hey, this is really working. Oh, that's great. Uh, well, unfortunately, uh, Reagan here has a different way of accomplishing the same thing that we're doing for our organization. It seems to be better, it seems to be cheaper. So, yeah, but what's it going to do to our organization? What's going to be it might threaten the existence of it. I mean, there are a lot of people just terrified at the idea that the business organizations could cast go out of business. 
well, we've got to protect ourselves. And that, one of the, one of the books that I uh, wrote was uh, In Restraint of Trade. And the subtitle of it is uh, the, the Business Campaign Against Competition from 1918 to 1938. It's basically a, a study, very, very heavily documented. So it's, it's either has a lot of support or a lot of annoyance if you don't like footnotes. Um, about how the business community in America, large business, tried so many different ways to try to basically cartelize American industry, to keep competition from causing some people to go out of business. And you couldn't do it. In a free market, a cartel is a very weak structure. It just doesn't stand up. So every time they tried something like this, it collapsed. They tried again, it collapsed. They tried voluntary codes of association uh, our trade association codes of ethics collapsed, didn't mean anything. Along comes the depression, and business leaders said, aha, here's our chance. And so the, the business community put together the New Deal of FDR. It wasn't much of it, as you hear in so many settings. FDR finally dragged the business community kicking and screaming into the 20th century. No, the business community dragged FDR into it. FDR was a willing on the subject. So I don't know. Um, the question often arises in the same setting. If, you know, if we didn't have government, how would we provide for roads? How would we provide for parks? How would we provide for schools? This, that, and the other thing. And my answer has always been the same. I don't know. <laughs> no, I don't. I, I don't know what's, what's going to happen. I don't know what the cure for cancer is going to be. But I have confidence in the scientific process to discover that. Well, how can you how can you say things like that if you know if you say you have all this confidence in the scientific method and tell us the answer? Yeah. There is no answer yet. There, there's, there's a process. We spend so much time on answers. My students, my, so many of my students are this way. I use the Socratic method in teaching, and they, they don't like it. They want an answer. Tell me, I've actually created this very active um, hypothetical, all kinds of you know, ramifications of it and so forth, which is designed as a learning experience. And, and when we finish, I always get a student say, well, what's the answer? I don't know. Well, how would a court decide that? I have the slightest idea. I really don't. You know, these questions that I'm raising in class, I don't know what a court would do, particularly in 2011. Uh, I don't know what they're going to do. I do know this. I know what kinds of noises to go into court and make on behalf of the client. Oh. So, it's, it, so much of our learning, it, it's a process. It's not... It's not getting to the substance of something. And we're not learning when we learn a new set of facts that we're going to kind of institutionalize and you know, carve into the archways over our buildings and so forth. But it's a process. It's a never-ending process of, of inquiry. My favorite word in the English, English language has always been the word why. Why? 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 Somebody comes up with a well, we've got to do such and so, we've got to take care of the people in, in Iraq or something. Why? Have you ever noticed that when you ask that question? They just shut down. Because huh? <laughs> yeah. people on the, in the media tell us that's what we're supposed to do. I don't know if that answered your question. I, I think, I think, I think a non-institutionalized world is going to be whatever you and a lot of other people make of it. I think that in a non-institutional world there will be hundreds. Can you define, hundreds, hmm? Can you define what an institution is? Yeah, that's what I said before. It's an organization that's become an end in itself. Okay. It's an organization that is too big to fail. Well, we can't allow these great big organizations, the great big institutions that have 10,000 employees, we can't allow them to collapse just because they're incompetent. When you stop and think about that, I mean, that's a hell of an admission. Why are they in trouble? Because, in part, probably because they're, they're too large. Uh, another book I would strongly recommend to those of you who might not be familiar with it is a book by Leopold Kohr, K-O-H-R, titled uh, The Breakdown of Nations. 
war was an Austrian, uh, well, he was an Austrian economist, but he worked in, in other fields. And he wrote a book in which he discussed what he called the, the size theory of social misery. So whenever something is wrong, something is too big. And at some point, when we start institutionalizing our organizational, our social behavior, we start repressing the individuality of people who make up those organizations, don't we? All of a sudden, you know, instead of we're all working together to accomplish some end, we get to the place where we say, look, you better get in line, Buster, or, or else. Yeah. Think of the think of the the greater good. Uh, I don't I don't know if, I don't know uh, uh, what a greater good is. People talk about well, there's really the you know, some sort of a common interest that we all have. The only common interest that I have ever found that we all have is a need to protect one another's individuality. And instead, political systems work the other way. They say, no, we've got to. That this group, and this group, and this group, fighting with each other. And if we can get, if we can get the uh, management fighting with unions, and if we can get farmers fighting with city people, then in comes the politician to say, "What? Well, I can resolve this for you. All you need to do is to give me more money and give me more power." I've got the feeling that by year coming up on the stage, you're trying to say to me, get lost. Uh, you still have a couple of minutes if you want to, mm -hmm. don't, if you want to complete uh, what you're saying. No, that, that, was, that was basically it. That's so. good. I, I would like to just add one, one point. This, going back to this whole notion of of, of, of spirituality, what it means to you as an individual, how, how all of this affects you, the, uh, the drives within your own self that are often the kinds of influences that you can't even put into words. In Eastern philosophy, they, I forgot who it was, I think one of the Taoists that said, you know, if you could put these concepts into words, everybody would have told everybody else by now. You know, it's the question of you know, how do you how do you expect other people to respect your individuality, respect your own own energies, and so forth. And I remember when I first read some of Ayn Rand's works. I, I'm not an objectivist, by the way. <laughs> we learn about the world purely through subjectivism. All of my opinions, all of my values, everything is my own subjective opinion about things based upon what I already know. And I think we all operate this way. But her, her work did not impress me because of the reasoning and because of the logic or anything like that of what she was saying. It was because of the passion that she had. I don't know how many of you read any of her, read of any of her work. It's the, the idea that, damn it, you don't do this to people is more powerful, I think, than beginning with the premise, uh, thou shalt not initiate coercion against another. This is so called, this person is doing such and such, he's initiating coercion against another. Ergo, this conclusion. The power on that was the passion that you don't do it. Thank you very much. Yep. Uh, thank you, Mr. Schaefer.